Welcome everyone to Fundamentals of Kabbalah and Hasidut. We are continuing our series on the life and teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. It just happens that this past week, some of you may get this online, but every week, Gali Nai puts out a weekly Parsha uh, booklet. You can get it online, go to Gali Nai, but it just happens in this, uh, this one, Rav Ginsburg talks about four innovations of Hasidut from the Baal Shem Tov. And so I, I actually had something else planned for tonight. We were going to continue with, we, we, we went through the basics of the Baal Shem Tov's life. Then we introduced a basic fundamental teachings of the Baal Shem Tov that, that launched the Hasidic movement. And then last week, we started with specific teachings from the Baal Shem Tov. And that's where we will be continuing. But <clears throat> I've gone over this article a few times and I thought um, it's so appropriate to get Rob Ginsburg's take on the, the foundations of Hasidut as taught by the Baal Shem Tov. And what's interesting is that of these four innovations, we really uh, dealt with uh, all four of them already. But the way that he explains it is just so good. <laughs> and so um, I wanted to, to, before we go deeper into specific teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, to get Rav Ginsburg's take on the, what he calls the four innovations of Hasidut. So where he starts though, and this is very, very interesting, is that along with these four, he says all four of these are based on one premise of the Baal Shem Tov, one teaching, which we also discussed. And that is how the Baal Shem Tov interpreted or understood the Arizal's cosmology, which uh, the, the cosmology of the Tzimtzum. Just to review something we have discussed many times is that the, the, the Arizal uh, gave over this idea that before creation, there was only the infinite light of God, no time, no space, nothing other than the infinite light of God. And when God decides to create the world, he had to do what's called simtsum. He had to contract his infinite being in order to make a place for finite reality, that there would be a place for something, as it were, other than God, finite human beings, time, space, material, matter. After the Arizal passed away, so there were many, many discussions as to exactly what the, Baal, the, the Arizal meant here. The Baal Shem Tov took a very, very strong stand. And we have discussed this, that is the symptom, is the contraction to be understood literally or figuratively? And the difference is, is actually quite major because if it's literal, then there's this place or this idea that there, that there is a place that does not contain God. That is, is ap, God is absent as, as it were, even though into the empty space that's created, God shone a line of light. And, and from this line of light, everything that we uh, experience in reality, including the, hundred, the tens of billions of galaxies are all coming from this ray of light. But that light is coming into a, 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 a empty space, a vacuum. So are, are we to understand that there really is a place that's somewhat empty of God? 
The Baal Shem Tov said, no, we do not understand this literally. It's not only figurative, but from God's perspective, nothing changed. It's only from our perspective that we perceive a symptom, a contraction. And so Rav Ginsburg continues and, and explains that according to the Baal Shem Tov, the way he explained it, it wasn't so much that God withdrew his infinite being in order to create an empty space where finite reality could exist. It's more that God concealed himself. And from God's perspective, there was no contraction at all. And so the Baal Shem explains the, the ramifications of this is that the, the presence of God is everywhere, at every moment, at every time. And that in essence, there is no real difference be between before creation and after creation. These are very philosophical ideas, but we're going to see in these four innovations how the Baal Shem took this idea and kind of brought it, brought it down. So Rav Ginsburg brings that the way that the Baal Shem is explaining it solves a, uh, we'll call it a problem brought up in Pirkei Avot. In Pirkei Avot, it says, Whoever looks at four things, it's better that they would not have been born. What are the four things? What is above? What is below? What is before? And what is after? What this means is that since these ideas, if someone... Um, gets into them too much, it could drive someone batty <laughs> because we don't have definitive answers. We have answers for all of these, but it's not something that you can put your, your finger on. And so here it says, you shouldn't look at what came before. And what's interesting in the teachings of the Arizal as published by Rabbi Chaim Vital, the, the Arizal does not deal with anything before the symptom. In other words, what came before the symptom? What, what was the infinite light? What was the mechanism that went into going from infinite light to finite reality, other than the symptom? Later, Kabbalists did delve into this. And Hasidut delves into this. So according to the Baal Shem Tov, it's not a problem because in essence, the infinite light of God from before creation fills the finite worlds as well. And the way he puts it is like this. If, however, God's infinite light is not just a thing of the past, but also present here and now, Engaging with it is not a forbidden glimpse into what is before, but a deep dive into the reality of the present. Now, this is how Rob Ginsburg introduces the four innovations. And we're going to see in each one of the innovations, it is somewhat dependent on the ramifications of the Baal Shem Tov saying, that the symptom was, it was from, from our perspective only. From God's perspective, and there's even a verse, it says, Ani Hashem lo shaniti. I am God, I have not changed. So the Baal Shem would say, I have not changed. The way I am before creation, the way I am after creation is the same. And in fact, that infinite light fills this world. 
But the tsimtsum, the contraction, means it's concealed, not withdrawn. So you can hear there's a big difference of, of holding that God's infinite light has been withdrawn from the world and saying, no, it's there. It's just concealed. And one of the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov is, where is it concealed? In the Torah. When we learn Torah, we are accessing the infinite light of God. Okay, now let's go into the four innovations as Rob Ginsburg sees it that come directly from the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. So the first one, and like I said, we've actually dealt with all of these, but here uh, Rob Ginsburg is just adding a, a depth and a richness. So the first one is unconditional love of every Jew. Now, this is one of the first things we discussed in the first class that when his father was on his deathbed, he told, he told the Baal Shem Tov, who was five years old at the time, two things. One is to love every Jew completely. And two, not to be afraid of anything other than God. So here the Baal Shem Tov bases his whole life, his whole philosophy on this idea of unconditional love. But Rav Ginsburg explains, and this applies to us because we're, we're human beings, we're far from perfect. And he said, even though we have a mitzvah, you have to l'recha kamocha, should love your neighbor as yourself. We have a mitzvah in the Torah. So what did the Baal Shem add here? But if you look at different sayings of the sages, that if, if a Jew is not keeping the Torah, is publicly, let's say, desecrating the Torah, the mitzvot, so in a certain way, it becomes a mitzvah to reject him, to rebuke him, sometimes to put him in what's called cherem, in, in um, what's the English word for cherem, um, like, like exile from the community. And there are all kinds of laws that, um, let's say a person doesn't keep Shabbos, but he comes to shul on Shabbos. Can you give him an aliyah to the Torah? Some people will allow it in our day. Other people will, no. You're, you're welcome to come to shul. But if you, if you publicly drove here, I can't give you an aliyah to the Torah. I, I actually, without naming names or places, there's a, a wonderful rabbi who went into a very, very Jewish neighborhood. No orthodoxy whatsoever, but just full of Jews. And he, he was so beloved and he, he was so open. He, he built an incredible community, incredible community. But in the beginning, he made it. He made it clear, everyone. I'm not looking how you got here. But if you got here by driving, I can't give you an aliyah to the Torah. And that actually, because people loved him so much, and he and loved the Torah he was teaching. Within a few years, he, he has this huge Orthodox community. So I, I'm just mentioning that this idea of unconditional love, there's another side to it. There's another, there's another side to it. But the Baal Shem Tov came and said that, and he also said that the way we look at others, if we look at just their, their actions and we're not looking deeper into their, into their souls, we tend to be very judgmental. And then it becomes very, very difficult maybe to love everyone if people aren't acting maybe the way we think they should. But the Baal Shem Tov came and said, 
unconditional love of every Jew. And where you see this in act in total practice is Chabad. Chabad all over the world. It's not just a nice teaching from the Baal Shem Tov. They put it into practice that, of course, they're encouraging everyone to keep the mitzvah. They're encouraging everyone to, to, to do mitzvot, but they take everyone as they come and they love everyone and they'll go out of their way to incredible lengths in order to help any Jew in any situation without differentiating. This is coming from the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov went, let's say, beyond the letter of the law of what it means to love your neighbor as yourself and <clears throat> put this out. So Rav Ginsburg explains this is also connected to the idea of not seeing the symptom as literal because God is everywhere in everything. And so we always have to look at the essence of everything. And even though we might want to teach and help people change their outside actions, it doesn't, it doesn't affect that, the, that everyone has a, a holy soul. Now, so here, Rav Ginsburg says at the end, and this is so beautiful, it's so beautiful. He says, in fact, the Baal Shem Tov extended this principle to loving all created beings, all human beings, all animals, and even all of nature. The very fact that God created them indicates that he loves them, and therefore we should do the same. So this is the total, all-inclusive love of the entire creation and everything in it, and because it comes from God, and because God fills all time and all space. And so therefore, it actually now I realize why I chose the song, open up your hand and provide for all living beings. That's the song that we played. God gives sustenance even to the evil. Even to the evil, <clears throat> God provides sustenance. <clears throat> Ultimately, though, has to be some kind of a clarification. But still, in general, God is providing. So that's the first innovation from uh, Rob Ginsburg's idea here, the four innovations of the Hasidic movement. The second one, again, we've discussed, but now we'll get Rob Ginsburg's input, is joy in serving God. We went right from the beginning, we, we discussed the world that the Baal Shem Tov was born into. He was born into a historical period of incredible challenges and difficulties for the Jewish people. There were just, uh, it was only 50 years after hundreds of thousands of Jews were slaughtered in the Ukraine and Russia. Pogroms could, could break out at any minute. People were dirt poor. And it didn't appear there was very much reason to be joyous. Now, to the credit of the Jewish people, the Jewish people, through great faith, held on. But it wasn't that the service of God was full of joy at the time. So when the Baal Shem Tov came on the scene and started encouraging everyone to be joyous, it was like a, a a breath of fresh air. It was just so radical, revolutionary. And it, it's actually very, very, very similar to 
when Reb Shlomo started singing in the 50s, this was less than 10 years after the Holocaust. And we had reason to be joyous because the state of Israel was born. That is true. But still, it wasn't like the happiest of times. And Rav Shlomo also just burst on the scene and he's singing and he's bringing, he's bringing joy. So here Rav Ginsburg says that going back again to the Tsimtsum, if God's infinite light fills even finite reality, and God's presence is in all things at all times. So this is what he says. He says the perception that God is present in everything can sweeten much of the bitterness and sadness often associated with serving God solely out of Yira Shemaim, the fear or awe of heaven. And he says that, again, if you look at the symptom as literal, and then we, we can we can look at certain situations and, and think like, well, like they say, where was God in the Holocaust? Is, in other words, there, there is parts of reality that we can interpret that there's no presence of God whatsoever. God is contracted as infinite being. So Rav Ginsburg says, if we know that God is present in everything. It helps us look for the, the light at the end of the tunnel. That it, it's there, it's just somewhat, somewhat concealed. And so he brings the idea from the Zohar that we've mentioned many, many times. This idea that crying is on one side of my heart and laughing is on the other side of my heart. And he says that this is, this is really simultaneous, that the way the world is, there is reason to be broken and to be joyous at the same time. This is, uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to a wedding tonight. This is the symbolism of breaking the glass at the wedding. At the highest joy of, of the chatan and kala, the groom and the bride, but also the highest joy for the community, the families. Still, we break a glass to remember that we're still in exile. The temple is still not built. We still don't have redemption. And yet, this is at, at the, the pinnacle of joy the, joy, the joy of a wedding. So he says, even though we have to hold both of these feelings all the time, but the main one has to be joy. And that, that's, that's, that was the innovation from the Baal Shem Tov, is yes, there's reason to be broken. There's reason to be worried. There's reason to be fearful. But none of that should overwhelm all the reasons to, to be thankful and to be joyous. The third innovation, here he calls, he calls it devotion, but then he calls it devekut. Many times we interpret the word uh, or translate the word devekut as clinging. But here he, he adds, uh, it's a very subtle, the idea of serving God with devotion. That when we serve God with devotion, what it means is the awareness of God's presence in the immediate moment. And if you remember, that this is a teaching from Rob Ginsburg. He doesn't bring it here, but when we talked about the history of Kabbalah, and Rob Ginsburg says that from the beginning of the mystical tradition, through Rabbi uh, Moshe um, Cordovero, the Ramak, 
that the idea is what is called hishtal shalut, the idea of trying to explain the world according to a hierarchy, a chain of events, measure for measure, cause and effect, how one thing follows another, to, to try to understand the flow of reality, the flow of creation. The innovation of the Arizal was what Rav Ginsburg called heat lab shoot, enclothement. That, that reality is not just cause and effect, which is somewhat one dimensional, but that everything encloses other things, deeper meanings. That's the explanation for Bina. The sages say Bina is to understand one thing from another thing. That not just in cause and effect, that within each thing enclose many, many different levels. And the example we always bring, of course, is Sphira to Omer. The way that we count the Sphirot, this is an exercise in what's called enclosement. That Chesed is not just Chesed. There's Chesed Sheba Chesed, there's Gevura Sheba Chesed, there's Teferet Sheba Chesed, Netzach, Hod, Yisod, Machut. There are all these different aspects. And that is true of all of reality. When you look at anything, the idea is to look a little deeper. That was the innovation of the Arizal. And then Rav Ginsburg explains that the Baal Shem Tov, his chiddush, his innovation is what he called hashra'a. Hashra'a means immediate experience of godliness in the present moment. God is here and is here to be experienced. And so that's what he calls devekut. That's what he calls devotion. Is, is let's, say, let's say we imagine that God is up there someplace running the world. He's the master. He's the director. But he's somewhat removed. And now I'm commanded to do mitzvahs. So I do the mitzvah. And I do the mitzvah because I'm commanded to do it. I'm doing the mitzvah because I believe that God feels that it's important for me to do the mitzvah, that it's good for the world. And so I do the mitzvah. But what the Baal Shem Tov is saying that when I do the mitzvah, I have a direct access in that moment to God. God will, is in the act is in the thought, the kavana. God is everywhere at all times, but he's there to be experienced and to be clung to. To veku means to cling to God. So Rav Ginsburg brings a, a teaching from the Baal Shem Tov where it says, when we say a certain brachas, we say the beginning, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Olam, and then it continues, Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvot Tav, who makes us, who sanctifies us in his mitzvot. Um, mitzvot Tav is a plural. So the, the Baal Shem Tov said, why is, it, why is it plural? Obviously, there are many mitzvot, but the Baal Shem had a different explanation. He says, every mitzvah has two levels. There's like two mitzvahs in every mitzvah. One is the action, and the other is what we call kavana, the kavana in the action. And so Rob Ginsburg says it very clearly. He says, the Baal Shem Tov placed the value of the vekut devotional clinging by creating a deep spiritual connection with God 
at the center of the believer's life. Service to God that does not penetrate the innermost heart he taught is ultimately empty. And this is an expression that is, I'm, I'm not sure of the source, but uh, tefila beli kavana keguf beli neshama. Prayer without in deep intent is like a body without a soul. Empty. It's like a body without a soul. There's no, there's no life there. So the Baal Shem Tov is saying that that is how we cling to God. We cling to God through our kavana. And not only kavana. We have, we, we, the, the mitzvah becomes the, the channel, the, the vehicle of connecting to God. But if we don't fill the vehicle with intent, we, we kind of run off the road. We don't get to the destination. So there's another, uh, he actually, uh, the Baal Shem brings another verse that teaches the same thing. Chacham lev yikach mitzvot. A wise one of the heart takes mitzvot. So again, why is the word mitzvot plural? I mean, the obvious is because we have a lot of mitzvot. But the Baal Shem taught, chacham is intellect. Lev is heart, the emotions. So every mitzvah, in a sense, has to be a combination of not just the action, but the intellect and the heart together that will fill the, the physical act in a way that allows us to cling to God. And there's a beautiful uh, uh, numerical or letter uh, permutation that teaches us. If you take the name of God, a yud and a hey, and a vav and a hey, and you take the word mitzvah, a mem and a tzadi and a vav and a hey, so we'll immediately recognize that the last two letters are the same. The vav hey of God's name and the vav hey of mitzvah. If you take the mem and the tzadi and you exchange them in the alphabet called atbash, so the mem becomes a yud and the tzadi becomes a hey. And so therefore the mitzvah becomes the vehicle to cling to God. Very, it's a very, very deep teaching. So Rav Ginsburg adds, again, this is all flowing out of the Baal Shem's idea that the symptom, the contraction, it should only be understood from our side, from God's side, his infinite light before creation, his infinite light after creation, is all, it's the same. But it, was, it has been concealed. And our job as, as individuals and as Am Yisrael is to reveal godliness in the world, is to take that concealment and bring it to a state of revelation. So here, Rob Ginsburg says that uh, uh, many people have commented on it, that, that there are certain understandings of God, which um, we we'll use the word um, sanitize, sanitizes God, meaning that we make God so unapproachable. God is so, uh, so much greater, uh, uh, not accessible, 
that we, in a sense, distance God from our own experience. The Baal Shem taught, Rav Gendrick says that the entire wisdom of Kabbalah rests on the, uh, on the insight that God is not a sanitized God, that God is what we call a person, can be perceived as a personal God. We can have a personal relationship with God. And he says that all of Kabbalah is based on this premise. He says the Baal Shem Tov took this one step further. God is not just overseeing the world from above, but also dwells within it. And we have the ability to connect with God here and now. Then the Baal Shem took it one step further. And this is connected to the idea that the divine soul is a chelak eloka mima'al mamash, an actual part of God above. So not only <coughs> excuse me, does God dwell in this world, he dwells within each and every person. Each and every person has a spark of godliness. Okay. That was the third innovation. And the last one is also one that we have discussed. And that is, in all your ways, know him. Based on a verse in Mishlei, the Chal de Rachacha de Ehu. In all of your ways, know him. And so here, this is certainly one of the greatest innovations of the of the Baal Shem Tov. Is he 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 took as it were, God out of the synagogue, out of the Beit Midrash, out of learning Torah, and out of prayer exclusively. Of course, he didn't take them out of those places. But there was, there was an idea that uh, our, our lives were somewhat um, a dichotomy. There's our religious life. That's when I, I go to pray. And that's when I sit and learn. And when I go to work and I deal with the realities of this world, that's my, that's my secular being. There, there, many people still have this idea. <clears throat> what the Baal Shem was trying to show was one can have an experience of God, one can find God, one can connect to God in everything that we do not just when we're learning or praying. And it's based on this verse, Bechal derechecha de'ehu, in all of your ways, know him. So Rav Ginsburg says, he said that this is, in a certain way, a new way to understand a, a very ancient concept calling Kadesh make yourself holy in those things that are permitted to you. What is the usual understanding of this? The usual understanding is there are things that are forbidden to us and there are things that are permitted to us. But even the things that are permitted to us, we should be careful to do them in, in, in a holy way. In other words, we're permitted to eat. Well, we can eat like it's called like a behema. <laughs> we can eat like a wild animal. Or we can eat with great holiness and great uh, intent. 
but it's permitted to us. So that's what's called Kadesh et Atzmacha Mutarlach. All those things are permitted to you. Make sure you're doing them in, in a beautiful way, a holy way, a special way. So that's the usual understanding, and it's obviously correct. It's correct. But what the Baal Shem added, and I'll, again, I'll read from Rob Ginsburg. The Baal Shem Tov certainly accepted this principle, but added that sanctifying ourselves with what is permitted to us also means sanctifying ourselves through the permissible. In all the secular matters we must deal with, we need to search for the hidden holiness in them, which has the power to elevate and sanctify us. Let's just go back to the example of, of eating. We can look at eating as there's nothing intrinsic about eating that is holy that is a way to connect to God. Why do I eat? In order to give me strength to do mitzvot, to give me strength to learn, to give me strength to pray. And so the act of eating is a means towards an end. That's not a wrong concept, but what the Baal Shem added is, Wait a minute. Eating itself can be turned into a holy experience, can be turned into a way of sanctifying ourselves and coming close to God. And the example I'll bring is on Shabbat. It's, it's very customary for people when eating that they, they, they eat a little bit slower than usual. And before a biteful, they say, Lekavad, Shabbos, Kodesh, for the sake of the holy Shabbos. So that turns the eating into, in, in, into a whole different experience. And it actually makes it physically, it tastes better. <laughs> It actually works. <laughs> it, it tastes better because it's for the honor of the holy Shabbos. Okay, so Rav Ginsburg has a conclusion here. And he says like this, and I, I'll read the whole paragraph. He says like this, we presented these four points as innovations. He has it in quotations as innovations of Hasidut, as before that they had never been presented in quite this way. But you should know that they also present an element of renewing the ancient. As such, they are reconstruction of simple and self-evident principles that were always present in Judaism, but which exile and forgetfulness buried. In this sense, all the Baal Shem Tov did was dust them off and reposition them where they have always belonged at the center of Jewish life. So he's making a very, very important point, And I believe I made this point already as well, is almost everything that the Baal Shem innovated in a general way. Now, we are going to be continuing with specific teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, which were innovative. And as he said, he, he saw verses in a way that no one had seen them before. But as far as the basic foundations of, of Hasidut, Rob Ginsburg is making a, an important point is that none of them were like pulled out of a hat as if no one knew that that serving God with joy. David Amalek, 3,000 years ago, wrote, Eve do at the Shem Simcha. Serve God with joy. So it's been there for thousands of years. But because of historical realities, the, the idea of, of 
feeling like serving God with joy had been somewhat buried. And, and the reasons are, are very uh, understandable. They're understandable. But that is an important point. That is a very, very important point. So um, even though I said before that there would not be time to do the chats, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end the class a little bit earlier. And, I, and I, I'm going to go, I'll have exactly like 15 minutes. I'll go through as many of the chats as I can. And um, we'll have to leave it at that. One second here.